When did it begin? That's what I've been asking myself all night. I think the worst part is that I always knew deep down. I always knew something was wrong. But when you're around a bad smell long enough, you get used to it. You don't smell it anymore. And that's what happened to me. My family has been in the fur tree industry for three generations. At that time, my father and his father have created one of the biggest suppliers of Christmas trees in our state. Me and my brother, grandpa, dad, and mom live on a property together in a big old sprawling house. My sister chose life outside of the family business. We plant new saplings all year round and we harvest just once a year, hauling the trees in our lot in town to be picked over by the public. All my life, I've been surrounded by these beautiful trees for miles in each direction. As soon as I was old enough to be alone, I'd take walks between the arrow straight rows and pretend to be a pirate or an Indian. I think I was nine the first time I felt it. I was walking my dog Skipper, and he ran up ahead and out of view. The trees were full and lush at that time, ready to be cut and sold. I couldn't see my dog, so I started calling out his name. Halfway through hollowing for the upteenth time, a cold, prickling sensation ran down the back of my neck. It was such a strong, sudden feeling that I stopped my tracks and quit yelling. I turned in a circle for no reason other than what I assume is primal instinct. When you get a feeling like I did, the lizard brain, or whatever it is, fires up. There was nothing there. But I couldn't get myself to move. Something was still wrong. And I realized what it was. There was no noise. Other than my heartbeat in my ears, there are so many little sounds you don't notice until they're gone. Bugs, birds, wind. There was nothing. Everything was still. I thought what happened next was in my head for a long time. My parents called it a panic attack or a hyperventilation. All I know is that soon as I noticed there was no wind, I couldn't breathe. It was like trying to suck air through clay. None was getting through. I grabbed my throat and almost fell to my knees in panic. But that lizard part of my brain, it came through for me. I started running. My body felt like it was on fire. I got about 200 feet before it collapsed. When I hit the ground, I could breathe again. Skipper never came back. As I said, when I got home and told my parents what happened in between sobs, they told me I had a panic attack of sorts. It made sense, so I believed it. Except when I was in bed at night and my mind wandered back to that day. And I'd think of Skipper running away without a second look back. It was real. You better be careful. You better watch out. I felt so stupid thinking like that and forced myself to stop. Skipper would come home. Dad would find him any day now. I just panicked was all. Soon enough, I convinced myself it was nothing. And life went on. Only a few events had been as surreal as my breathless moment between the trees. Most occurrences were small, easy to dismiss, easy to think it was just in your head, easy to forget. You'd find yourself staring to the firs from the house, looking for something. Your eyes scanning a wall of green, not sure why. You'd walk through the saplings to check on their health. Then you'd take a sly glance over your shoulder, as if trying to catch whatever had been following you. As there was nothing anything there, and you'd shake your head and sigh at yourself. We stopped keeping dogs when our fourth disappeared. That run of coincidences raised eyebrows, sure. Grandpa said it was probably the farmer over the way, either stealing them or killing them. Or it was wild dogs or wild animals, though that was unlikely. Our fur forest was run on a tight leash, and most of our land had been walked by one member of the family or another. No one had ever seen any wild dogs or any other predatory animals. When I was 26, I broke my leg. I was walking with my grandpa and brother, surveying which trees for those ready and those not. I took a step and realized there was no ground underfoot a moment too late, stumbled and fell. 
and my right femur bent and snapped as I took a dive. I stepped into a pothole. I screamed as ripples of pain like thunder rolled up my body. Grandpa and Jack were only about 20 feet ahead. Neither of them so much as paused. Black spots danced in my eyes and I felt close to passing out. Grandpa and Jack slowly walked on, chatting and making noise on their clipboards as I shouted bloody murder. I felt my blood pressure drop and my vision began to tunnel. I couldn't make sense of why they weren't stopping, but that didn't matter. All I knew was I had to keep making noise. Before I was sucked into unconsciousness, I screamed one more time. Grandpa turned to me. I felt relief almost stronger than my pain in that moment. Dropped his clipboard and ran to my aid, Jack following close behind. I recovered all right, but my leg has never been the same. Especially in cold weather, there's a niggling pain there. After surgery, I asked my brother why they didn't stop. He asked me what I meant. I was screaming. You two just kept walking. Jack frowned. You didn't start screaming till we were lifting you out of that hole. Our property became more and more accident prone as the years wore on. People often tripping on nothing. They become momentarily, inexplicably lost among the rows. Potholes appeared all over the forest. Grandpa once again pointed the bone of the neighbor claiming that now the guy had no dogs to steal. He was stealing trees, roots and all, leaving behind dangerous holes that already caught one of his grandsons, and he'd be damned if it happened again. Our neighbor was struck in a hit and run shortly after. No one said anything, but we all wondered if Grandpa could have been involved. By the time I turned 29, Grandpa was too old to be of any physical use. We began to hire some outside help during the harvest to ease the load. Grandpa spent more and more time on the porch. I guess he felt out of the loop. I'd often find the help eating lunch in their cars rather than the bench we supplied. I'd ask why and they'd just shrug. Didn't feel like sitting outside. They never did. My sister Louise rang us in December of last year. She and her husband were separating and she wanted to spend Christmas with us for the first time in a long time. And she wanted to bring along Sue, her daughter. Mom was over the moon. Louise is a postcard, phone call kind of woman. She was always fiercely independent. She came around on the 22nd with plans to leave on the 29th. Mom begged her to make it longer than a week's trip. Louise was coming from out of state after all. A long flight, a shuttle ride. It was tough on Sue to travel so far in one week, but Louise wouldn't have a bar of it. I want to see you, Mom. All of you. But I have to get home soon, okay? I can't stay longer. Sue'd grown so much. She was just over two and as curious as ever. It was nice to forget about work for a while. The help did all the cutting and hauling. Jack, Dad, and I took care of the sales at the lot and some surveying. We shut up shop at midnight on Christmas Eve with only a tree or two to spare. The next day, we took advantage of the unseasonably warm weather and had Christmas lunch outdoors in the yard. All of the family together for the first time in years, but this time including an extra generation. Worth celebrating. Dad couldn't get Grandpa to join us in the yard. Grandpa wanted to stay and overlook from the porch. That almost started an argument between the two, but Mom intervened before things boiled over. We ate on the picnic blanket. Mom played with Sue, who squealed and giggled. And then I had a turn while the others chatted. I guess I tired the kid out because she started getting a bit cranky. Louise set out a blanket and laid Sue down. As soon as her head hit the fleece, she drifted to sleep. Louise and I talked about life for a while. She admitted quietly that she'd been divorced for a year already. She hadn't wanted to tell mom and hadn't wanted to disappoint her. I told her mom could never be disappointed, especially not with her. And she'd love to see both her and Sue much more often. Louise smiled and looked over to Sue, but Sue was gone. Then came a frantic ten minutes. Louise shouted Sue's name over and over. Mom tried to calm her down, but it was useless. Dad told Jack and I areas to search, then gave some to himself and Mom. He told Louise to stay in the yard and keep calling out. We were about to begin searching when Grandpa yelled from the porch. On the tree line over there. 
He stood at the rails and pointed. We all stared across the rear yard, and then we saw her. A small, wobbly figure making her way into the forest. A puffy pink jacket and stiff little legs. Luis let out an exhalation of relief, and I began to jog across the yard to get Sue. I called her name, but she didn't stop. I came up to her. She was a couple of trees deep by then, and scooped her up. She flinched, surprised by the contact, then smiled cheerfully. What are you doing, little girl? I asked, and she laughed. No, no, not good. Why'd you wander off? I carried her away from the trees back towards the home. What were you doing, huh? She reached over my shoulder towards a receding tree line, grasping at the air. Mommy, she chirped. Mommy. Luis left later that day. Mom was upset, felt responsible. And so did we all. Just a little. But Mom also felt Louise was overreacting. Sue had wandered off. So what? She was fine and happy now. No need to leave. Once again, Louise had made up her mind and wasn't going to be swayed. We helped her pack, said bye to Sue, and I drove her to a nearby shuttle place. Tell Mom it's not her fault, all right? said Louise as we pulled into the parking lot. Well, it isn't. Kids wander. No. Sue doesn't. She gets anxious when she's away from me. We came to a stop. I helped her unload and hugged Sue one more time. Luis went to leave, then paused. You guys should just sell the business, you know. What are you talking about? She looked at me for a long while. Can't you feel it? I can't stand being in that place. It's like a fog, like a weight on my back. I, I didn't know what to say. I felt insulted, annoyed, even angry at the suggestion of selling our hard work. And then I felt scared because I knew what she meant. Call me crazy. Louise pet Sue's feathery hair. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just on edge. I'll call you when I get home. Stay safe. Grandpa died two months later. Jack found him on the porch. He was sitting in his favorite seat and wearing pajamas. His eyes were open and staring. There were pine needles all over the yard. Everywhere. Even on the stairs. We were told it was a major heart attack. Things have unraveled fast since then. Dad took to death badly. His health went into free fall. And he didn't want to survey or walk or do paperwork or even leave the house. He started having constant nightmares. He told me about one of them. He said that he was in the field of felled trees and something sticky was coming out of the ground. His feet got caught and he was stuck and terrified. There was something around, something getting close, something angry, something enraged, and it wanted him. Mom took to cooking and creating things it was her way of coping and her way of trying to bring dad out of his daze. She never understood much about the business. This was the only way she felt she could help. It worked just a little. She could get a smile out of dad with a partially well-made card or a nice dinner. It doesn't work anymore. Yet, she still cooks, crafts, cooks again. For no one in particular. Jack and I pretty much took over work several months back and we outsourced more and more labor. Business actually increased, but we struggled to keep up with employee turnover. People just quit. They just leave. I started spending less time among the trees, and more time at home in front of my desk. Jack goes out there just as often as always, though. Maybe even more often. Luis's words rattled through my mind constantly. Dad hasn't slept more than an hour or two a day since the middle of last month. When he does drift off, he wakes up thrashing and drenched in sweat. He won't let anyone try to help anymore. I've started to lose sleep too. Jack is distant. We hardly speak outside of work matters. At night, I hear things. The wind through the firs and that distant whine. I hear it louder than should be possible. And I hear rustling. Branches scratching against my window. 
But there's no trees there. Not even a shrub. Thanks to the last of our help and regardless of our isolation, we've sold hundreds of furs in the past month. I should be at the lot to help spread what we have left. Spread? Why did I say that? I wonder how many people have our trees in their homes. I don't know. I can't go to the lot. I'm... I'm too scared to leave the house. Laying out the story like this, it seems obvious I should have run. Should have gotten us all out a long time ago. But I couldn't see anything for what it was. Not really. I still struggle to. My finger hovers over the delete button. My mind tells me I'm crazy. Whatever is affecting my family has been a long time coming. It's built over the years, gaining strength slowly and surely. When I go outside, I feel paranoid. We're supposed to have one last haul of trees to lot later in the week. But no workers have shown. There's no one to cut the trees down or pick them up. And I'm definitely not going out there. Jack keeps surveying the trees regardless. He leaves at sunrise and doesn't come back till noon. Mom keeps cooking. Dad stays in his room and I sit on the porch. I swear the yard is getting smaller. And yesterday, Jack dragged up a Christmas tree for the lounge room. I didn't want him to put it inside. Not one from... out there. But I said nothing. We always had a tree. It's pot bound. And we've used it as long as I can remember. Now I can't find it. Jack jammed the new tree in the corner of the lounge. Mom's decorated it to the ninth degree and the ragged stump is tearing up the carpet. The top is bent and curled against the ceiling. And when I stand looking at it, I start to feel very small. The branches are bright and heavy with fairy lights. Mom and Jack sit by it and don't talk. I feel like the window of opportunity to confine to my mom and dad and brother pass me by. My lizard brain, it's telling me that there is a listener, a watcher, in the lounge room. It's waiting for me to slip up. I don't know anymore. I'm on the porch now, pretending to finish some paperwork. I get waves of goose flesh and I need to turn around. But I don't turn. Because what if it's there? What if the tree is there? I think I have to run, leave them. But how could I live with that though? What if something hap- Someone's at the trees. It... It looks like it's... It's Grandpa. And he's waving me over. <laughs>